Hello, hello. Welcome to the final Villages talk of this first day at B-Sides. Uh, we get the pleasure of hearing from Arpita, who will talk with us about um, all things hiring and interviewing. Um, so let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Can everyone hear me fine? Especially the last benches. Oh. By the way, quick check. How many of you, is this your first conference after COVID in person? <laughs> How many of you are overwhelmed by it? I was like, wow, it's grown a lot since, you know, when we started off as besides SF. How many of you are overwhelmed right now? I, I was stunned. Um, but OK, anybody having social battery at zero, please feel free to hop out, go back home, recharge, it's fine. I'm going to talk about trying to make some method in the madness that security is. So I'm Arpita, and you, know, you can find me talking security at conferences like this. I also mentor at Security Mentor Club. I also work for the Women in Cybersecurity. And in general, you can find me talking about security, saris, dogs, food, hikes, any of those, count me in. So when Tom actually reached out to me about Career Village, I know it's not the best of the times right now, which is why I, stepped, I wanted to help in any way I could. And my way of helping you all is, uh, for lack of any better words, distilling my gray hair into the slides that I have. So I hope it makes some sense. It's a very, um, it's a very click heavy slide. So I'm, I'm open to sharing the slides later on. So you don't need to take any notes. It's a click heavy slide because then it lets you go back home and take notes and go from there. So that said, why are you here at 4 p.m. still listening to me? I have spent over a decade in security. I'm currently at Databricks. I have worked at B2Bs like Databricks, Mapbox. I've worked at B2Cs like Fangs. I've worked at startups. I've worked at unicorn rocket ships. I've been there, done that. I've worn so many hats at this point of time that I've covered, you know, I've been a security software engineer, I'm a detection engineer, incident response engineer. I've been giving interviews since 2013. I've been taking interviews since 2020. So that's a lot of breadth, a lot of hats that I've covered over the years. And like it or not, some people might burn out, but I'm still here talking about security. So in this talk today, I'm going to cover a few, um, two, two aspects of interviewing. You know? One is, how do you interview for the different roles in security? Because there's so many kinds of roles. You cannot prepare for everything. When you are interviewing as a security engineer, you can be so many different kinds. And each of them need a different way of preparation. And the second, the other side is, how do you hire for these kind of roles? Because as a manager, you're constantly shifting between different roles, different skills, different people, different countries. How do you make sense of that? So that's what we are going to try to cover in the next 20 minutes. Wish us luck. So this slide that you see here is intentionally very text heavy. But it has almost all the categories that security means to different people. This is the mind map of a CISO. It's been on my wall for the last five years because even I lose track of it. So one side that you see is you, you have risk and governance, you know, features like there are a lot of people who do this on a daily basis of how risky is your business, how risky is the product, can we buy cyber insurance for a company, and those kind of decisions. The next set of decisions and the people and the teams working are business uh, risks. You have your disaster recovery, your business continuity plan, Right, ensuring all the processes, all the plans work as, a, as expected, all of that. The third category is compliance, legal. Uh, you know, it, to people outside of compliance and legal, it seems very tedious. But in my opinion, it's, it's one of the quickest way to gain your customer's trust. So if you have a new product in the market and you have a SOC 2 or some kind of compliance, I as a buyer would know that you have at least certain checklist done and hopefully done the right way so I can trust your process. On the other side, this is what I'm going to talk about the next three ones, which are in the trenches, more of IC work, more of people, like probably most of you here. That would be SecOps, 
which is a uh, lot of the operational in the trenches, reactive alerts, report, re responding to alerts, doing pen, pen testing, et cetera. Then we have the infrastructure side. You are probably an engineer working to protect your infrastructure, or you're an engineer trying to protect, improve your own product security. So these are roughly the, the groups. And as you can see, it's not easy, right? So it's, it's so many things. So when you say I'm interviewing as a security engineer, you could mean any one of these things. So if we were interviewing, I'm not going to go to the first three. I'm going to go to the next three. But I'm sure many of you, me included, have been in these kind of interviews where I've been asked random, terrible questions, not related to my workspace at all. So here's my note to all of you. When you are interviewing for a company, it's a two-way street. If you don't understand what's being interviewed, why you're answering certain questions, chances are it's not a good place to work either. So skip that, take it as a two-way interview, two-way street, ask them the equal questions, and we'll see deeper how. So the first category of interviews that we often or I have often given is product. You know, I'm building and my company sells security products, for example, at Palo Alto, right? So you build firewalls, you have a lot of the information in there, and you can see that common titles and roles are pretty much very common, like software engineer, cloud security engineer, network security engineer, all of these kind. The skills you need here, they are mostly uh, your basics of computer science that you need. You're a software engineer first, then a security engineer. So you can skip past the security classes if you want, if you want to go down this direction. But you also need to understand your business a little bit, because you can't build good features without understanding what your company sells anyways. So these are the titles, these are the skills. Coming next is how do you hone your craft if you want to be a software security engineer? This is not an exhaustive list. This is a list that works for me. But the idea that you should go away with is you should have your elevator pitch ready as a software engineer if you're interviewing for one of these. If I ask you, hey, what do you do? Second is you should try looking at all the regular um, software engineering interview questions that's out there in the market, out there on the internet, CDCI, lead code, et cetera, et cetera. Practice. Practice it because that's what makes you less um, practice where you fight. So if you practice in the right places, you're most likely going to be nailing those interviews. You can also start, given how hard the job market is right now, you might not be getting many calls, et cetera, et cetera. So you might start looking at open source projects, because that's where you're building up your, you know, your resume, your portfolio, you're working. And you're also helping some open source community uh, build products, which a lot of us in the industry often use. And last but not the least, if you go down as a regular software security engineer, you are potentially allowing your career and your movement in and out of very many different software products. It could be a database developer next or a Spark developer, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to stick to security. The next is proactive um, set of roles. These are security-specific roles where you're looking at either improving or securing your product or improving and securing your infrastructure. By that, I mean, you know, for example, if I build, if my company sells potatoes, how can I secure the potato? As in, like, are there any bugs in it? Are there any vulnerabilities in it? Can I scan it? That's ProtSec. How can I protect the farm, which is your infrastructure for growing? So that's possibly AWS, Azure, GCP, wherever you are building your infrastructure. So that's corporate infrasecurity. And then you also have bits and pieces of enterprise security thrown in, for example, how does your company configure Okta, or what do you do with LastPass, or I hope no, no LastPass person here. But all of those things put together is uh, your proactive security engineering. When you are in this field or in these roles, you should focus on preparing more as a security engineer first. You might not have the greatest coding skills, but if you start preparing your security engineering skills and bring up your coding skills later on, that's totally fine. For improving, um, you know, for improving interviews and talking more about this line of work, I would say uh, all the list here. And shout, shout out to projects like Yara, the OWASP cheat sheet, 
you have uh, OS Query Radar. These are all, I mean, look up GitHub for security projects. You will see the most starred projects. Pick anything that suits you, start contributing. Because the minute you contribute, you have something to show to an interviewer that, hey, I have done this piece of coding. So that itself is half a battle won there. Oh, last but not the least, I want to call it the sixth bullet point. For the longest time, I never had a good CTCI equivalent for security engineering. And then Tad came up about two years back. He put up a very rough list of security engineering questions. I don't think it's been updated much since then, but it is the best that we have out there. So if you want to look in one place, what all do I need to answer, I would start off from there. The third category, and I'm smiling because that's what I do right now, the third category is reactive security ops. This set of roles is uh, mostly your IR ops, your um, investigations, your threat hunting, your detection engineering, your forensics analysis, your red teaming, all of these comes in as reactive roles. So the skills that you need here, actually the first skill I would hire for is resilience and integrity. You will have burnout if you don't have these two and if you can't keep up with the pace because it's an incredibly fast moving. It's a roller coaster ride. I can walk into the office on morning and be like, oh wow, or oh no. So it can go either ways. But then comes the technical skills. You still need, you know, you still need to know the tools of the trade. You need your sore, you need your hunting skills, you need SQL pretty much quite a lot. You need to know how to parse through large amount of data logs, everything else in there. So all of that put together makes it reactive security, which is very close to being a roller coaster ride, but you can also burn out. For these, I would say the first thing is you should say is, hey, I survived these many years doing IR, or I survived these many years doing pen testing. That to me is the biggest fact that you're still talking about it, means you are, you've survived it, you want to do it, and you're doing it for the right reasons. A lot of the learning that comes in from here is where most of the hacking resources come in. You might want to look at security conferences as well, because at, you know conferences like these end up having a lot of hacking conversations as well. So on the list here, you want to talk about conferences, hacking uh, expertises, do, do the CTFs that, have, that conferences have. If you don't want to do that path, but that's a very haphazard path. If you don't want to do that path, you can also go look up any course, any online certification, which I'm, I'm not pro or for, for certifications. I just think it's a good way to give a structured learning that you would need to nail that role. So if you want to look at some roles there and look at some incident handling um, courses, that would be the place to go. So that said, we have covered the three series of interview tracks. We have the product where you build security products. We have the proactive improving shift left security. And then you have the reacting where you are fighting fires day in, day out. Now comes to hiring. If you thought giving an interview is hard, which it is, it's nerve wracking. If you thought giving an interview is hard, try taking interviews for 100 people and be standard evaluation, you're fair, you don't have your subconscious bias, you, you are doing the right things day in, day out while you're interviewing those 100 people. It's incredibly hard if you want to do the right thing, which is also why when you're giving an interview, you never know it went well or not because it's very subjective today. So how do you make a very subjective process into a more detailed or a more standardized outcome so you're hiring for the right skills rather than what you think is the right person. Some things that have worked for me are outlined here. You don't have to follow them, but they have made my life easier, which is why they're on the slide. The first is preparation. Actually, the first two slides are preparation. The first preparation that I do is for my team, Anybody and everybody, whenever they're joining, every quarter, every once in a while, every one-on-one, -on -one, gives me a chance to go and look at the skills and mat capabilities matrix. On the left, I dump out everything that I think my team needs. It doesn't have to be filled in by one person. It can be filled in by 15 people. But that's the list my business needs from my team. It can be something as stupid as industry network. How do you, how do you quantify that? There's no degree for industry network. Or it could be as technical as rootkits and containers, right? But it's all there. It's all on that page. If you make it available to your team, your team knows what you want, 
they, they know the transparency, they know where they can grow their career, they know what gaps exist, and not only that, they will sometimes come in and be like, hey, Arpita, you know what? I want to learn that skill next. Can you help me do that? So that makes your job as a hiring manager much easier. What it also does is it lets you do targeted hiring. It's very painful to maintain this list up to date, but I think it's worth it because at the end, it allows you to do what I'm going to show next, which is targeted hiring, but also it helps you be a better nurturer or a retainer of your talent in the team. So this, when you see, is that gap list that I've identified and put it in an interview panel. Once you've identified your gaps, what next? You need a series of people to interview your candidates, right? So that can happen in two ways. It can either be like, hey, five people go interview this candidate. They'll come back saying, great, not great. You don't quite know what is, why is someone great or why is someone not great. Or you can give them this evaluation matrix where you say, hey, if you are if you are interviewing a candidate for me at an L3 level, this is what I expect them to be. If you're, and then you go down and you see L6, it's all that L3 has, all that L4 has going on and on and on. And then you add layers to that onion. And so it makes it very easy for your interview panel to hire and interview a person that you want rather than they would want on their team. So it allows you to hire, it allows you to ask people to evaluate using their intelligence, but your, your selection criteria. Having done these two prep materials, do you, now, now you come to the actual hiring. This is all pre-hiring before you open, open your rec. So when you come to hiring, you need to do about six or seven things. One, don't try to hire unicorns. None of us are unicorns. Being a unicorn is extremely challenging, extremely burning out. We will not have security people if we, try, if we continue hiring unicorns. Second is keep the skills and capabilities matrix very up to date. Once you have that up to date, half your job is done as a manager because then you know what to hire for, which candidates to go for, where to showcase, you know, my, my, I need a gap, I have a gap in GCP. Okay, fine, go to a Google conference, you will find GCP ca contain, uh, candidates there. Then be very cognizant of, um, you know, what you write in your job description. You don't want to copy paste a same job rec from five different recs because then you're hiring the same kind of candidate every time, which does not improve your diversity. So when you, once you write down, try to minimize it to five to seven items that you need on the, on the candidate, and that's it. And you will not find unicorns, but you will find the exact kind of candidate that you're looking for. Then. Sometimes, and I've seen this when I'm hiring in different countries uh, of late, is because everyone's on video, every country has a different video bandwidth. Every country has a different holiday month. Every country has different cultural jokes. So when you're hiring as a manager, if you, if you are not cognizant of the workings, that someone could have a different working style, a different uh, thinking style, a different language style, you're missing out on a lot of thought diversity that would actually benefit your team. So when you have that list there and you know which, which countries or ge geolocations you're hiring for, what gaps you have, put it in your evaluation matrix, stick to it, and then you will have a holistic and diverse interview panel, which will give you the kind of candidates that you're looking for, and the interview candidates would then fit into one of the three buckets that I shared earlier. So going back, interviews are a two-way street. If you are interviewing and you don't like the team you're talking to, stick to your gut. It's harder to do in a job market like this. So I'm take that with a pinch of salt, at least for the next six months. But also when you're the hiring manager for an interview, check in with the candidates. They might not have liked the experience which you thought was amazing and you spent so much time preparing for it. So be open to that feedback as a hiring manager because what you see, what you think they're getting is probably not what they're getting. So that was my uh, gray hair in a slide deck. And that said, I'm also available in all of these places. Happy to answer any questions now and or later if they come up. <laughs>